I love to see the towns passing by and arrive these rails neath God's blue sky. Let me travel this land from the mountains to the sea, cause that's the life I believe. And when I'm gone and at my grave you stand, say God called home your rambling man. Welcome to Ramble Man Podcast, episode number 144. This one's with Jason Copeland. We talk about comic book art and his book that is being crowdfunded right now called Full Tilt. Shout out to friend of the podcast, Michael May, for introducing me to Jason and kind of helping me get him on the show. It's a great talk. Jason is Canadian, so any of those little Canadianisms that pop up are, are wonderful to hear. If you'd like to back Full Tilt, as of today, you still have 10 days left. So today is Memorial Day, Monday, May 29, 2023, in case you're listening to this next year for whatever reason. But you have 10 days left to back Full Tilt. And it's at zoop period gg slash c slash full tilt. Or you can just go to any of Jason's social media and click through there where there's a link. It's just Jason Copeland on social media. It's spelled Copland, but I'm pretty sure he said it was still Copeland. I hope. And if not, I apologize, Jason. But Jason Copland. (laughs) <laughs> on social media and and that is also his domain j-a-s-o-n-c-o-p-l-a-n-d dot com and on all your social media give him a follow and and back full tilt if it's still up and going looks like a really cool book and i can't wait to get my copy which i did back before i even interviewed him not to pat myself on the back and I'm using the word back a lot here, uh, but did it because it looks really cool, and I can't wait to read it. And also, a uh, shout-out to him and Michael May. Go and buy their book, Kill All Monsters. It's a great book that you should get, and I hope they do more of it in the future. But thanks to Jason for being on, and back full tilt. Sponsor this week is Feral John. Feral John is a graphic design, illustration, and social media consultation company based here in Knoxville, Tennessee. So they do work for clients big and small all over the country, all over the globe, in fact. But they also do photography, videography, video editing and audio editing, website design, SEO, writing, content development, Hell, they'll babysit your kids if it nets them money. So make sure you give them a follow on social media on either Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn at at Feral Giant. And be sure to give them an email today and hire them for your next project. Without much further ado, here's the episode. In listening to the After Lunch podcast, I picked up on a, a few uh, Canadian inflections. So you're from Canada. I That's am. where you are. You're, are you originally from Canada? Yes, I am. Yes. Uh, which part of Canada are you from? Uh, Western. I was born. I was born in Edmonton, but okay. mostly raised in BC. Okay, I know. I picked up on a little bit of Canadian stuff from Kevin Smith talking about hockey and <laughs> uh, shoot, what's the the high school show? Why can't I remember? Oh, uh, Degrassi Junior. Degrassi, yeah. yeah. And then I listened. There's the there were these two sportscasters, Jay and Dan. They were on TSN that I listened to somehow found their podcast and yeah. listened to them and loved them. Thought they were hilarious. <laughs> and uh, so I know that my, I've only been out of this country one time and it was for one hour or two hours in Canada. Went up oh, there, yeah. had, had Tim Hortons and came back into, <laughs> is it Windsor? That's right across the border from Detroit. Yeah. yeah. And it was a real shithole. No offense. Oh. It was a real shit. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I, a lot of, a lot of, uh, <laughs> I won't say a lot of Canada, a lot of Ontario, uh, is not super nice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it was cause I have, I'm 
I'm predisposed to dislike anything in Ontario, though. That's that's an East versus West thing. I mean, although technically gotcha. Toronto's sort of central, but um, yeah, uh, consider them I'm, the East. And oh, I, I, I'm 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 with you. I'm born in born and raised Tennessee. Uh, Knoxville and Memphis agree on one thing: they hate Nashville. So, and uh, Knoxville, Chattanooga, Memphis, everywhere else. We all hate Nashville and Nashville hates all of us. So trust me, I understand. (laughs) I understand a lot. Uh, Okay. So you grew grew up there. What did your folks do for a living? Uh, Well, uh, my parents got divorced when I was very young. Uh, So I stayed with my mom. My mom, uh, I don't even really know what her career was. She was sort of... um, yeah, like a numbers person. She would do accounting and that sort of thing. My okay. dad actually is an artist. Um, and I've only recently reconnected with him. Um, but uh growing up I was, yeah, just I was a latchkey kid. Okay. Living, uh, yeah, living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> Car- cartoons, Doritos, Mountain Dew, yeah, all oh, that yeah. good stuff. You're yeah. talking, yeah, you're right right up my alley. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any I, brothers or brothers or sisters? No, no, only child. So I had free reign. Yeah. Oh I could God. go wherever and do anything. So yeah, it was pretty good. And were were you into art as a kid? Did your like mom encourage you to do art? Uh no, I don't not that I remember. Um like I uh I did draw I did draw as a like a young child, like through usually just trying to uh mimic what I saw in comic books. Um but I was never super serious. Like it wasn't until high school that I kind of was like, Oh, I guess I can kind of draw. And yeah. And then, and then I kind of just stuck with it from there, but early on now, I just like, like any other kid, you know, would make a mess with crayons or whatever, but never really <laughs> took it that seriously. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you mentioned comics and your comic book art, like, was it comic books and cartoons? Was, was there anything that, stuck out to you when you were growing up any artist or well um the, i seem to be i gravitated to a couple books that were uh by our uh, herb tramp the like the um yeah. the uh shogun warriors oh, i freaking love the shogun warriors comic it only ran 20 issues but man i love that book and uh and, and then i would you, the Hulk issues always seem to be the ones that I really liked always seem to be Herb Trimp. So, um, right. uh, but it was roughly, well, how old was I? Probably about 10 or, that I um, started reading like, um, well, maybe a little bit older, uh, Alpha Flight and, um, and uh, a little Fantastic Four. And uh, there's that, you know, John Byrne was the guy. He was, he was the man. And, uh, crazy story i haven't really told this very often um so my my father went to school at aca alberta college of art mm-hmm. and um he's actually that he was there at the same time john byrne was there really yeah so john oh byrne God. ended up getting getting work and he quit school and just started drawing comics at like uh Char- what was it charlton um yeah but uh so anyways I didn't know this. I didn't know any of that. And uh, one day I was looking at these comics and I was like, Oh, I really like this comic. And, and, uh, and I said, John Byrne's name. And my mom was like, who? And I said, Oh, John Byrne. And she's like, Oh, and then she took me over to this big trunk that we had just, just full of junk, like uh, LPs and blankets Mm -hmm. and whatever. And she pulled out this and I actually have it somewhere in here. I'd pull it out if I, if I could find it easy, but it's a, a large illustration, 11 by 17 illustration of the demon that John yeah. Byrne drew in like 1971. Holy and gave shit. It, yeah. And gave it to my mother as a goodbye gift. And oh she's like, this is, this was done by John Byrne. I was just like, what? And then <laughs> I'm reading in alpha flight number seven. Um, there's a doctor, a psychologist that uh, Aurora is going to, and she calls him Dr. Boston. That is the last name of my father. That is, that was my name back then was Boston. Oh my God. And, uh, 
so my father is actually in an alpha flight comic which is that, oh my pretty God. amazing yeah um but again at the time i had no idea I, yeah. just that they were yeah that they were remotely connected so yeah it was a mind-blowing thing for however i was <laughs> well however old i was 11 or 12 or something um yeah i was just like what so i still have the drawing it's 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 packed away somewhere okay but um have you not tried to seek him out at a conference or at a comic con or something and say hey man <laughs> uh i sent him a letter when i was like 13 okay and he gave me the brush off so i was just like oh. whatever yeah i was like oh yeah i knew your dad and then that was sort of it and oh, so I, I just left it at that yeah well i've heard he's kind of a curmudgeon anyway so um sometimes it's best not to meet your heroes yeah um, so i never I, really seek them out no I, I will say i was at uh i think it's heroes con in charlotte and there was somebody i really like that's not a i'm trying to think if i should out him or not <laughs> probably it, not <laughs> probably not i'll tell you afterwards i okay. hate when people do that shit on podcasts but yeah it was somebody that not a lot of people knew not a yeah. lot of people you know whatever uh artist that was did his main work was bigger in the 80s and mm -hmm. he was just sitting at a table sitting there drawing and it was like come up at this time and get a comic signed by him or get a, or, i was like cool i went and bought a comic of his that i loved and i brought it back up and i was like hey is it he had an assistant or somebody i was like oh is it time because i was literally sitting there looking at my watch the time it's and she leaned over to him and he was like uh come back in 30 minutes and that happened like three or four times over the course of like an hour and a half to where I felt like I was a stalker at mm. one point. Cause I kept staring and being like, all right, it's time. And I tried again. I'm going to go, you couldn't take 15 seconds to sign my damn comic book. Yeah. And I bought a comic for like $12. I was like, I, didn't, I already got a copy of this. I don't need this. It's like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and that was one. I've got a few of those. That I actually, the first time I met Michael May in person was at Wizard World Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, that he had mentioned, I knew he mentioned on the After Lunch pod that I was on the Steve Niles website. So I was one of those people that he he met and knew. And, uh, but we met him at the Chicago and there was two or three people I met at the Chicago Comic Con. That I was like, man, don't be a dick. You're not yeah. big enough to be a dick. Like, come on, brother. <laughs> come on yeah, i've got a couple of those stories but i don't trot them out no yeah well i just no, don't talk no. to those i just don't talk to those people I, i'm pretty good at um isolating myself from negativity and people that um that kind of like, cause me mental yeah. grief uh i just shut them right out I yeah just, they're not worth it so i just shut them. <laughs> I, I had to tell somebody that a younger i work with some younger people and I told her something. We she was complaining about something, and I was like, "Hold up, hold up, hold up, stop!" I was like, "Okay, this is going to get very negative before it gets positive." I was like, "You're going to die one day. You don't get that time <laughs> back. Walk away. Walk away. It's the easiest thing in the world. You're you're going to die, and you're not, and you're going to, you will never regret walking away from that person." I'm like, oh, okay. I was like, "Trust me, <laughs> trust me." Trust me, kid. <laughs> I've seen the shit. Yeah, I've been burned one too many times. <laughs> oh, okay. So, Alpha Flight, man, you're on brand with Alpha. I want to bust your balls for saying Alpha Flight, but uh... <laughs> it's too easy. It's too easy. Uh, so, into comics were cartoons ever a big thing? Uh, I mean, they were they were around, but I I think the only one that I ever was like semi-religious about following was um um battle of the planets okay um which is kind of ties into my interest with large robots same with the <laughs> you know the shogun warrior comic okay um, but yeah cartoons were never i was never really super interested in okay. animation type stuff were you ever into any other kind of art like fine art like painting or sculpture or anything that any not until i went to art school okay um but uh, yeah, I don't. I wasn't really, really exposed to any of that stuff. Um, so yeah, that didn't come till later. Okay. And you mentioned in high school is when you kind of figured out you could draw. Was it high school when you started taking art classes? When art classes were available? Yeah. By the time I hit grade ten, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty much all of my electives were art classes. So most most of my <laughs> senior years were were art. Uh, okay. I would I wouldn't say that. I mean, I said it earlier that I start had a talent or whatever, but I was not very good. Oh. I mean, I, it, it, when you're when you're in a, a school of it wasn't very big. Our graduating class was maybe a hundred kids. Um, you know, and then of that, there's only so many people that took art. I was the best of those, like <laughs> 10 people that took art. Okay. So, uh, or maybe not the best, maybe second best. There's, there was, uh, Marguerite was pretty good, but, uh, it was one of those things where it was like the positive re- reinforcement that I got from kids, you know, I draw something and they'd be like, Oh, that's really cool. It helped me continue to, you know, to have an interest in, in art. If, if it had, gone flat if they had said oh you suck or whatever i probably would have just quit drawing i don't think it was a passion thing at that point it was just sort of something to it wasn't chemistry and it wasn't (laughs) math you know what i mean yeah Uh, yeah basket weaving i guess a lot of kids would be like oh you took art because it was super simple and 100 straight up yeah i did uh but at the same time uh it was probably the only place i was getting any like real uh positive reinforcement and, you know, I'm starting to create an identity for myself uh, as the art guy. Um, and so by grade 12, I was, you know, I was okay. kind of the art guy, you know. And I, I guess since your mom had some experience, did she kind of also kind of encourage that and shepherd that in, you You know, Ooh. get you to do more? No, not or, really. Or was it like, you need to be a doctor? You need to be a doctor. <laughs> she, well, again, I was, I was a latchkey kid and I don't think oh. she really had any sort of you know, I saw her for dinner and then I'd go out and play street hockey or whatever. And then I'd come <laughs> home and she'd give me shit for, uh, you know, being late or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, that was pretty much my existence. I didn't see a lot of her. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and she wasn't into art and or anything like that. Okay. So it was never like, a, well, you had to continue. So it was my, it was an own personal thing that let, okay. you know, kept me going. Yeah. Where, was it so you said you went to art school was it uh teachers or who who helped you figure that out that that was a a reality because i think for most people it's like you either got to get a job or just go to college in general yeah. like after school like what was it who guided you towards or was that a self-guide that was a self-guide as well okay yeah uh, i took a year off high school like out of high school i took a year off and then uh and then I saw all my friends were going to university and there I was, I had a sh- shitty job at a slaughterhouse and, oh, uh, and, uh, and I was like, Oh man, this can't be it. I gotta, I gotta figure something out. So art was really the only thing that I had going for myself. So I, uh, I applied to, uh, the Alberta college of art, go back to, uh, Calgary mm-hmm. and, um, and see what happens. And yeah, I got lucky cause that was the only place I applied. And those days you actually had to make a portfolio, like you had to take your, your actual art, mm-hmm. put it into a portfolio and mm-hmm. mail it. Uh, it was not, there was no internet. Um, you know, that was still a twinkle in somebody's eye at that point. So, uh, you know, I was lucky, like one that my portfolio got there, uh, two <laughs> that they like looked at it and liked it and accepted me and that I had, uh, that I had enough financial stuff, uh, that I could go, um, yeah, I had I had got some bursaries and stuff, so I was able okay. to afford it. Um, yeah, so and then I was just off to Calgary, and it was you know a chance to be my, on my own. Uh, yeah, so that it was a good thing. Um, art school sucked though. Um, as soon I as I say, got there, was it more like broad that they tried to get you to learn a bunch of different things, or did you? Yeah, they let so you, you take focus? like a found. Yeah, you like take a foundation year where you where they try to teach you lots of stuff. Um, and so uh, that was fine. And I really liked my drawing teacher. Um, and, but they, and at the time, that's when I was starting to get into comics and I was like, Oh, maybe I'll be a comic illustrator. And I thought, well, John Bernwin here, uh, you know, uh, well, no, uh, art teachers in the, uh, late, uh, eighties, early nineties were not hip to to comic book art oh my god they and they did their best to drill it out of me and and say that that was not a valid form of expression it was juvenile it was low art it was all of the negative things that uh that they were trying to get rid of out of the art world and so uh 
so yeah so by the time I finished um doing my art school stuff that was sort of like you know comics were not not something that I should be focusing on so uh after graduating um it actually took me about five uh maybe even more years to like say oh maybe I should look at this comic book thing again um because I was working music retail and I was starting to hate my life again and I was like well art was pretty cool maybe I should (laughs) try to do something with that so uh yeah and then I started getting back into reading comics and uh yeah and then it just sort of ramped up from there but uh, there was definitely a time where I just stopped drawing. There, there was no drawing happening. Oh, okay. I was going to ask, you know, working in music retail, did you do any like band po- show posters or anything? No, no, no. It was pretty much just, um, yeah. Music retail, Stop. Go, sure. go to work, come home. Yeah. Although, yeah. although at that time uh, you will remember the long CD boxes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We, is, I, I start I started uh, music retail just as they were getting rid of those. Yeah, the long okay. boxes were starting to go. Um, yeah, but that, I remember that, <laughs> God, those things. Somebody brought that up on a different podcast I was listening to. I was like, "Oh my God, long boxes! Mm-hmm. I forgot about long boxes." And it was always so weird. They were always so weird, oddly it's, shaped. And the the guy who on the podcast he was like a sales rep for one of the record labels and he's like yeah it's because it's the size of uh the long boxes were the size of two Mm -hmm. or two of those were one vinyl it was literally just a logistics issue yeah because they didn't know how to display it no no and then they had those weird plastic things that were like security that were the exact same size yeah they had locks they had to lock them and stuff yeah yeah music man that that is one thing so I worked in, in middle school and high school, worked at a ballpark, tending the field and scorekeeping and stuff and worked more than 40 hours a week, even though I was 11 years old, which I still getting paid $3 a game if I was lucky. And, uh, and then I went to work for talk at Taco Bell. And when I started in college, I was like, why the hell didn't I go try to work at like a record store? I was, I'm such a music nerd. What the hell was I? I was like, cause I wasn't cool enough. And God love the record stores here. You had to be cool. Oh, and I was yeah. like, I was not cool. I was a big, goofy ex-football player. They didn't <laughs> want my ass in there. My my look like a, a, a 10-year-old with the chubby cheeks. They did not want that in there. <laughs> Whereas I would be in there and be like, well, you know, if you thought about listening to some nerd shit, and they'd be like, wait, what? How do you, you're, you're a football player. You can't know that shit. That's I, right. You should only know ACDC. <laughs> hey, hey, no ACDC. So I can remember. I'm trying to think what I was listening. This is what I put on to listen to while I was waiting. The Hoosiers. <laughs> score. What, what's on that? That That's not just soundtrack music, is it? It is. Oh, it okay. is. I yeah. love that soundtrack for whatever. And one of the record stores here got a just shit ton of soundtrack and scores. So I got like Last Starfighter, all this 80s stuff for yeah. cheap i love that dude like the the record <laughs> store guy here he's a bit yeah. old metalhead but anything outside that every once in a while be like what do you know about this band he's like Cause, what do you know about in our barbecue because i just got every in our barbecue album i was like I, no they're not my jam dude and i was like <laughs> but there are people that know them and here's what you should price them but but yeah he that hoosiers one was like three dollars it's like i i'm gonna get this this is cool i can't nice. i can't yeah. pass on this <laughs> okay so music retail hating life <laughs> like i gotta get yeah, back just, into comedy. yeah and trying to figure out you know what, what to do next it was just that sort of thing and yeah so 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 did it seem like when you first started did you just kind of do stuff for yourself or were you trying to submit to like because back then it was marvel dc image maybe dark horse yeah is that about right i can't remember when dark horse started yeah dark horse was definitely around um okay when i started doing it but you know i went the indie route i didn't really um i think i i think i once sent something to marvel um Mm -hmm. like it was a spider-man submission that i did 
Um, and of course I got, you know, a no thanks, which rightfully so it was <laughs> crappy, but, uh, it was one of those where I was just like, well, I'll just keep drawing. I didn't do my own stories. I didn't write them or anything, but, um, you know, that was the beginning of the internet. I could hook up with people on message boards, writers that were saying, you know, oh, I need an artist for this. And, uh, you know, I would do, we do pitch pages or whatever. It was never anything that was super serious. And then um, it was like 2000 where I actually started working uh, uh, with a, actually a, a metal uh, bassist. Uh, he, he, he's in a metal band. He's in a bunch of metal bands. Um, <laughs> uh, Ken Faggio. And uh, he's a writer and he's like, oh, I've got this idea for a um, uh, Greek mythology tale. And uh, that was right up my alley. I'm like, yeah, 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 let's do it. So we actually did a full issue of it's called Braids of the Gorgon. And um, and we did, I did a full issue of that. And I started working on the second issue. Um, and then I got tapped to do a few anthology things and stuff. And then that the braid stuff kind of fell apart. We didn't we kind of I kind of left it behind and started doing this other stuff semi professionally doing, um, you know, pitch pages. People were paying me. And that's sort of, and I just kind of built from there where I eventually that was sort of my deal. I was still doing uh, like, it wasn't a full-time thing. I was still working uh, music retail. And then I started working at the library here in Vancouver, um, okay. which was awesome because it's union and I was getting decent wage. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. It was like, Oh money. And then I had money that I could actually buy comics and stuff because uh, I couldn't buy a whole lot off music retail money. But um yeah, and so it just it was a gradual build. It was uh, anthologies and that and pitch pages. People were paying me to draw pitch pages and that sort of thing. And then, yeah, and then eventually I just managed to get lucky uh, and uh, and have a few things that were actually paying. And then uh, and then I got the the call from uh, from Marvel to do an issue of Daredevil with Chris Omni and uh, Mark Wade. I did a kind oh, of a fill in thing. Um, yeah, Chris did the layout. So I, as I say in other interviews, I, I don't take the whole full victory lap for oh. that one. <laughs> uh, he did a lot of the heavy lifting. So, um, you know, uh, but Chris is amazing. He's such a nice guy. And, and uh, he was very supportive because this is the first time that I'd really done anything like substantial. Like I had done uh, short stories and had a few things done, published in, you know, smaller. So I had, I think at that point I might've had a a few things in image but like backup pages or backup stories that sort of stuff okay this is like my first like real like whoa okay um yeah, and chris was awesome he still is and um yeah and then just after that i i i uh, went i got a leave from my uh, from work and then i've been doing comics ever since so oh, okay yeah. so your your day-to-day -day is art-based every it is, it is yeah. now yeah how long how long has that been uh that'll be coming up 10 years wow yeah i will say that my wife has a very good paying job oh. and she floats me like you would not believe <laughs> uh, i don't <laughs> the amount of money my son who worked uh during the summer he's uh 16 well he was 16 he's 17 now but the money he made during the summer was more money than I made, oh, uh, like probably like two or three years running. <laughs> when I'm doing, uh, when I was doing a full tilt here, which I've been working on for like five years, uh, I made next to nothing. So yeah, um, it's a, it's definitely a, you know, a passion. It's just a, uh, a labor of love and, uh, wouldn't be able to do it without uh, the support of my wife. Though. Yeah. So. Oh, there's a, a buddy of mine that I had on a few episodes ago, Adam Kennedy of Refill Coffee Cart. He does a coffee cart and his wife is co-owner and one of their friends, Chad Graner, is also a co-owner. But he was like, oh, yeah, if my wife wasn't working a full time job, I would be working somewhere. <laughs> I would not be doing this. And he was like, I'm trying to get there. We're trying to get there. But he was like, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky. <laughs> that's great that's great uh, i think that it's really important to like um acknowledge that right yeah. uh, i think a lot of people are under the you know if i didn't say it a lot of people would be under the the uh the impression that i float my own boat that i'm making making money doing all this and it's 
it's so not like that um yeah yeah it, it's been a it's been a tough battle um but uh a battle that that i'm happily battling <laughs> <If> I, yeah <laughs> you know what i mean um, yeah yeah so do it's you, worth do, it yeah i was gonna say do you do cons and stuff and do commissions or anything like that to help fill mm-hmm. in i used to do conventions um yeah. but uh just pre-covid i decided to kind of stop it okay. and then being canadian going across the border um is is a real pain before COVID. it was a real pain to take anything across because um yeah uh the people that work at the border don't like it when canadians bring goods to sell in the united states so uh so it was always awkward going across the border and eventually i was just like you know what i'm not going to do it anymore um so i would do shows here in canada yeah um and then at some point i was just like I don't make enough money. Like this is another thing that people generally don't talk about in the comic book world is that most shows, unless you have a decent following, most shows are a loss, a financial loss for most people. Yeah. So by the time you fly there, you hotel there and and these shows now are like three or four days. Like it's not like just going for a weekend. You sometimes you have to fly in on Thursday, do the the preview night. And then there's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Um, you know, and you have to have a hotel for all those nights and, um so to come up with that amount of income to to balance it all off is for at least somebody at my level was pretty difficult to do okay and so i just i just kind of pulled the plug on it all yeah and then when covid came i'm like i'm not going down i'm not doing anything (laughs) anymore that's it Uh, that was my easy out it was just like i'm done yeah oh my god (laughs) yeah uh so i will say god i feel bad telling you the story but so i go into canada and I'm driving across and I'm stopped at the border, never been across the border, don't know what the hell I'm doing. And the lady was looking at me and she was like, So, uh, Tennessee, huh? I was like, Yes, ma'am. She was like, Um, are there any guns in this car? Or do you own a gun? Mm-hmm. And I was like, No, ma'am. It, are there any guns? I, I can't remember what order she asked, but it was just drilling me on, Did I have a gun on me? And yeah. I was like, n- n- No, don't, don't don't stereotype me because I'm from the <laughs> South, damn it. Cause I'm from the South. Like, come on, yeah. son. And then when I came back, the guy on the Detroit side said the same thing to me. I was like, what the, f- no, no, I don't have any guns. I'm not an idiot. What the hell are you talking about? Like such well, awkward, and awkward, both ways were so awkward. Yeah. It, it my, very- aunt, my, my aunt, uncle, well, my uncle and then his wife, uh, uh, they both worked at the, um, at the border in Aldergrove, so uh, lower mainlandish uh, area um, in in BC. So I would hear all about the people that would come across or try to come across with weapons. And oh my god, you would be shocked at how many people they for, they even forget that they have them. Like they oh they're like, uh, well, do you have any weapons? No. Uh, well, if we search your vehicle, will we find any weapons? Well, you. Yeah, you might. Oh, there's the one under the seat. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Ah, yeah. There's one in the glove box. And it's like if they don't, if they're not super serious, and I'm like, check. Uh, yeah. There's people that forget they even have them sometimes. Oh my god. And see, here I was pissed scared because I had bought. I'm a cigar smoker, and I'd bought a bunch of cigars in Detroit, mm-hmm. and had went over, and they were in the back of my car. And uh, and when I came back, I was like, oh shit, are they going to think those are cubans because they're not i bought it i still have the receipt somewhere <laughs> it's like but are they gonna bust my chop for bringing in cubans I was, and then i thought later i was like they got bigger fish to fry they're not <laughs> going to worry about somebody because i think it was literally like six cigars it wasn't like i was bringing in cases and and i was like ah, they're not going to give a shit well i don't well maybe you being american they wouldn't give a shit but my uh, mother-in-law went across the border maybe maybe like three months ago and she had an orange Oh yeah. I've heard about this. I've heard about the fruit thing, yeah. which is so, so weird. And so she's like on a watch list now, whenever she goes across the border, they essentially go through the car because oh she took God. an orange down once. <laughs> oh my God. The guy from in on the Detroit side did ask me, he was like, are you bringing anything back? I was like, uh, Tim Horton's donuts in my belly and a little bit of coffee there. And he just, he didn't crack a smile. And I was like, uh, God, man, come on, man. I'm just, <laughs> 
I'm trying to enjoy this. Like, <laughs> like what the hell? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Going, going across the board has always been a big stress for me. So yeah. When I got to cut shows out, it, yeah, it was very, I was just like, Oh, thank God. <laughs> Although it's normally I would try to sell you on the States, but we're going through a rough time right now. Maybe it's good. It's good. <laughs> you You can eventually get down here. Yeah. Well, you, you talked about heroes. I've actually been to heroes twice and I, it's the only show that I still want to do like again. um, Yeah. It's, it's such a great show. And uh, it's like, cause it's comic. I was going to say it's such, so comic focused Yeah, that, that, that was amazing to me. I went with a buddy of mine who's an illustrator, who's a comic book artist and he can draw almost exactly like Todd McFarlane. Like, and I think that's really good because he's again, like me, he's some schmuck in East Tennessee. Like that's just, I don't think maybe he is self-taught, but he went and was showing it to an editor from Marvel. And they're like, no, your perspective is off and your feet, feet are all this nitpicky stuff. And I wanted to grab a Ben Temple Smith and hold up a Ben Temple Smith piece. I went, he is published. Yeah. Stop giving my buddy shit about it being off by three degrees. Like you're, you're an idiot. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah. I was getting mad at my, on my buddy's behalf. Yeah. That. But that, it was really cool. Cause like it was right as the nightly news with Jonathan Hickman was just blowing up a little bit. So mm-hmm. I got to meet him and I think he's a Southern guy too. And, yeah, I think uh, so. And then I Bendis and Mark Bagley were both there and I felt bad for Mark Bagley because he was stand sitting there signing and some dude brought a stack. Mm. It had to be at least 75 books yeah. right in front of me. And I literally looked at it, looked at Mark Bagley and went, started shaking my head and he just smiled at me. I was like, man, what the, I just want my one book here. So I, I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm not this dickhead, but yeah, but it was nice. Cause you like Bendis, would actually talk to people because he mm. had time because it was a comic convention yeah it didn't have all the celebrity the one here is more of a it's huge the one here fanboy expo there's one here in somewhere in florida and but it is very celebrity focused comic yeah. books are not even close it is more of a fanboy yeah it's more of a celebrity yeah thing. well there's one here in vancouver it's about the only major show that's in vancouver it's the fan Fan Expo Vancouver and Vancouver being uh, Hollywood North. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. They make, you know, they make pretty much all the TV shows up here. Um, so it's the focus is always on TV stars and movie stars and the comics are sort of these, <laughs> Oh yeah. You want comics? Yeah. I think they're over there. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I mean, they, Kevin, he runs them and he, he really tries to make comics feel like, like you know they're part of it all uh yeah. but the most of the people there aren't aren't there for comics which is really unfortunate um, yeah you know even on a really good turnout the people that are coming and engaging you at your table is fairly low that percentage is pretty low um but you know a show like heroes they're all there for comics yeah and uh and you got the cream of the cream of the crop of of creators like so many people to talk to um you can just walk up and down aisles and just like see so much stuff. And uh, I, yeah, I was amazed at Wizard World Chicago. Like I turned a corner and in the, what was it? Artist Alley. They're sitting on one end, excuse me, was Tim Bradstreet. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what the hell is he doing sitting out here? He, he needs, he needs to be somewhere else. Like, <laughs> and he's just sitting here. What the hell? And he was chatting with some guys like, now I gotta go find a Tim a preacher comic or a punisher comment for, I was like, good Lord, this dude's amazing. Like, yeah. What the hell is he doing? Just sitting here like that. James Obar was another one. The crow dude. Mm-hmm. He was just, I was like, what is happening? I don't understand any of this. This is crazy. Yeah. But that's where all the movies popped off and stuff. That's back when wizard world was actually a comic convention. Yeah. More. Anyway, there, there aren't any wizard shows anymore. Is there? They're, those are gone. Yes, I don't. I don't. I 100 percent don't know. Yeah, I don't I, know either. I imagine they are though. You know, it all it still feels weird to me paying a shit ton of money to go in and spend more money. Like it always <laughs> just feels so weird. I'm like, man. Yeah, there's a there's a there's two festivals here in Canada. There's one in Toronto, TCAF, the Toronto Comic 
art festival whatever mm -hmm. yeah comic art festival and then there's one here uh in vancouver that's actually happening next weekend i believe or this weekend coming up um called van calf and the they're not huge well the tcaf one's pretty big but um it's free to go in so okay you can just walk off the street and go in and uh and it's such a different feel right there it yeah. allows there's it allows anyone who has any remote interest in comics to get a chance to see them without having to shell it, you know, 40 bucks or whatever. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Because I got to think, man, you if you're a, a family and you want to take your three or four kids in there, good, sweet Lord. Like, that's <laughs> insane. And you're just screwing yourself on down the line because those kids like you get those kids in there and you start building more fans that's i don't know <laughs> what the hell do I, I what am i on a soapbox about this i actually don't care yeah yeah uh, uh okay uh <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna i told you i will get us back so okay. most of the all the art you do is comic book based do you do you still draw by hand or is it yeah. digital still draw uh, so by i hand? do my roughs digitally um, okay yeah uh but I, those are like pretty rough like they're people wouldn't sometimes wouldn't even know <laughs> what it is i drew um and then i print that out on boards and then i ink traditionally uh at my table so um, okay so the majority of what you see is done traditionally yeah and okay so i'm trying to get us there so do you like working, you mentioned ro drawing robots earlier, and I know yeah. the book, I, I think I backed Kill All Monsters, or I bought a copy. I can't, I'm sure I backed it, because I've been, Michael May's the greatest human being on the planet, so. He really is. Like, uh, I'm sure I backed, I know I have a copy, I know I've read it, it's been a while, but like, <laughs> I know Full Tilt, and we'll get more into Full Tilt, but it's more realism and then kill all monsters more like fantasy. Is there one you prefer or do you like kind of going back and forth between? Uh, that's interesting that uh, they're both pretty grounded in reality as, as, yeah. as much as um, giant monster versus giant robot book can be grounded in reality. Uh, I, I tend to approach them the same way in terms of design and drawing. So okay. I, I kind of see them as, as one and the same. Um, uh you know one's a little more uh fantasy based i guess uh one's a little more realistic in terms of content uh something that could actually probably happen as opposed to giant robots <laughs> and monsters fighting but um but i yeah i don't i i to me they're they feel pretty much the same okay okay just different body types <laughs> yeah <laughs> just different designs yeah yeah, yeah. okay uh, and going into full tilt, so full tilt, looking through the art and everything, and I can see the Sin City poster behind you. <laughs> so Sin City. So would you say Frank Miller is like your favorite artist or like your biggest inspiration? He's definitely the biggest inspiration. Um, yeah, it was Ronan, his book Ronan that mm -hmm. I discovered when I was probably roughly the time in a in high school where i was like oh i don't know about what i should do and then i found ronin and i was like oh comics look seem really cool yeah um, and that was definitely the book that was like oh this is really i really dig this i didn't understand it <laughs> <laughs> i uh yeah I, it took me uh it took me a number of reads to even kind of like yeah. yeah okay okay i get yeah okay i'm starting to get this now because it just shifts back and forth and I, I had read superhero comics. I had, you know, there was never superhero comics are as straight as you can go, right? Yeah. Like the the yeah. story is just here A to B. Um, whereas Ronan, there was a lot more thinking and uh, you know, the pacing and the and just the the way things are sort of interwoven, the fantasy aspects, what what was real, what was fake, what, what was past, what was now. Um, there's lots of stuff that I had to try to think about, which most comics i that was never some that you that was even in question it was like guy in outfit punches bad guy in outfit um 
You know what I mean? I so, want that uh, to I want that to be the new Wikipedia entry for superheroes <laughs> <laughs> or comic books. Good guy in outfit punches bad guy. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, so There's did that? Of, oh, oh, go sorry, ahead. Sorry. I just like there's a lot of people that would probably be very disappointed in yeah. you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> facts is facts uh did it make you go back and discover old, older frank miller work like the daredevil stuff or the dark knight uh well I, it, it, it it well dark knight i was right after oh, okay I discovered ronin like dark knight it was actually i think just coming out really um, okay i've got the timeline on him for some reason i thought ronin was right after dark knight but no 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 uh, okay. Ronan was was sort of his his first dip into DC. Okay, um, they just kind of said, "What do you want to draw?" And he said, "I'm I'm doing this," and then and then that opened the door for him to do Dark Knight Returns. Not that the door was cl- closed, but you know what I mean. It was yeah. it was an easy segue for him to do that. Um, but yeah, my friends, my friend was buying the uh, the Dark Knight Returns as they were coming out. So like the the prestige. Mm-hmm. Uh, 64 pagers or whatever they were or how they came out the four of them he was buying those and that's when uh comics that's when people discovered comics as like a collector's thing and yeah and uh and you know oh i'm gonna put this away i'm gonna buy eight of them and i'm gonna put them in a box and they're gonna be worth a fortune um so he was buying these books he was buying like four or five copies of each book and uh and I was like, oh, this looks cool. And he, most of the time he wouldn't let me look at them because, you know, I would wreck them or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you don't uh, want to get a crease or anything. In yeah, that. exactly. So uh, I think I bought one uh, one that was all beat up. I bought like issue two or three or something. And I was like, oh, this is cool. But I never never bought the it until it was in a trade form. So okay. that was a few years after that. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, no, Frank Miller was definitely a huge influence. Um uh, the pacing of the story and and then since sin city came along and uh you know the high contrast black and white um art and yeah that's right up my right right up my alley that's my that's my aesthetic right there um, <laughs> there was my buddy greg white and i uh man we did the thing in like our late teens early 20s where we we're like all right, man, what's the top 20 comic books of all time? You know, we got into those high philo- philosophical debates. And I remember there's the one issue of Sin City where it's completely silent. Mm-hmm. And I told him, I was like, I'm not kidding. That's a top five book for me. Because it's exactly what you say, the pacing, the cinematic nature of how he draws, like different weird angles and stuff that you don't normally see. Yeah. It's like, that's it. And he would always be like, you're an idiot. <laughs> that's, that's not that good and i was like no nah, man i'm telling you man this book is where it's at like yeah i'll still argue that it was yeah. it's a yeah those series i've i you know what's funny is during the pandemic i got all my sin city trades out to reread them and the pandemic was just too much i was like i can't read this this is yeah, too heavy dark, eh? <laughs> this is too heavy man i can't yeah. read this right now this is depressing as shit yeah uh <laughs> So like Ronan, do you like reread Ronan every once in a while? To... It's uh, it's it's always by my <laughs> it's okay. by my it's by my drawing table. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't generally leave my drawing table. Um, yeah, this is a book that. Um, yeah, the 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 beauty thing is uh, uh, is that um, I've got a first. This is a first printing. Uh, so my um. I saw this once and then I haven't been able to find it again online. So I, I could be telling a lie, but I I'm pretty sure what I read was that uh, the, the first printing of Ronin has the right near the end. Um, it gets, there's a close up of his mouth and he says, and it says, shut up mama. Um, and that that's, that, that's like a massive final line. Essentially there's nothing spoken after that. Um, and that's in the first, that's in the first printing. And then the story I heard, and I'm not hundred percent sure it's true, but I, that the, that when they went to reshoot it for, for following um, printings, that shut up mama fell off the artboard. And so really? it was published without the final words. And, uh, and I always thought like, man, that probably would cause a lot of people to go, like what just happened <laughs> yeah seriously um, 
yeah and uh so yeah so anyways every time i look at this and i see that i think of that particular story uh, when I, I should probably find out if it's really true i can't i don't I, honestly i can't find it anymore i saw it online um that, that's one of those bar stories you know you're in a be. bar you're in a bar and you're arguing about it and it's pre-cell phones and it's like nah, it's got to be true let's just let's just go with that's true yeah I it need to find somebody who's got like a like a second, third, fourth printing of the book and, yeah. and say, okay, open it up to this page and and what what's there. But anyways, um, yeah, any that book is that's massive for me. That book. Okay. Yeah. That is one. I got it. Man, we used to we used to have this comic book guy here, Stan, Stan the Man, not Stan the Man Lee, but Stan, <laughs> our comics guy, greatest guy ever it's a kind of a sad story. He worked at the post office and he had a comic book shop out in pigeon forge and he would work the weekends at a flea market. And that's how Greg and I met him or Greg met him and then introduced. And then he would have, a, he would be in his shop on the weekends and we would go visit him. And anytime he was, he was like, what are you into right now? I was like, man, kind of into Punisher. And he'd go, hold on. And he'd go to the back and just pull out a long box and go here you go here's all of punisher war journals one through the end it's like all right all right stan you got me i'm gonna do this and i i did that with ronan one time i was like i i just got back into comics red dark knight returns this is like 1998 or something it's much later yeah, yeah. Uh, preacher is what got me back into comic books nice and uh but Dark Knight Returns, I was like, man, I really want to cop, you know, a set of Dark Knight Returns. I like having the real issues. I was like, and Ronan, I was like, I, I've been reading about it and I see photos and, you know, early days of the internet. He was like, hold on. And he went back and he brought me, he's like, they're kind of dinged up, but they're still very expensive. <laughs> he was like, these are not cheap issues because they were not massively printed. And yeah. I, I think I read it maybe the one time. And once you started talking about it, I was like, holy shit, I got to reread Ronan, man. I haven't read that book in 25 years, probably. Yeah. Like, okay, I need to reread that. So, yeah, yeah, I'd, um, yeah, I'd, I'd read my, if you're going to get my book, read mine before you read Ronan. So, that, okay. So it seems like he's stealing from me. Yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, anybody at home that backs full tilt and gets it. You can't read Ronan until afterwards. That's in right. fact, we need the the men in black memory eraser thing. That's right. Like, like we did not mention Ronan. We did not mention Ronan. <laughs> Nobody on the, this is not a video podcast. No one's going to get that joke, but that's, uh, that's okay. Okay. So full tilt. Yeah. So you had done kill all monsters. Mm -hmm. How many, how many series or books do you think you've done in the time that you've uh, been doing comics? Well, you know, it, it feels like I've done a lot, but then I look at my shelf. I'm always looking up because that's where yeah. all, I keep all my stuff. And, you know, I haven't really done that much stuff. Oh. Um, I did, we did, I've done, uh, I did some stuff with Kurt Pierce. I, we did pop. That was at dark horse. Um, yeah, I did a bunch of anthology type stuff. I did, uh, I did a couple issues for, uh, IDW's dread, um, uh yeah and then kill all monsters mike and i did kill all monsters that book ended up so we did if you backed it on kickstarter that would have been like the um the ruins of paris trade and it's that's about 126 pages and then okay. when we got picked up by dark horse uh what happened is that we we put that book and then another like 240 pages or something in with that first book and it came out as a big omnibus so it's like 368 pages or something okay um, hard hard cover that came out through dark horse um so that was a couple of years of my life there too was doing the okay the kill a monster stuff so um but yeah kill a monsters is essential and popper essentially the only things that of any real length that i've ever finished so so the full tilt is is one of those feathers in my cap because I actually wrote and drew it as opposed to just drawing the stuff that that I've done before. So, yeah, I was going to ask, like, was doing full tilt? Was that the first time you wrote? And didn't you say that you've done you did the lettering on it, too? 
Was oh, that your first? Uh, I didn't do the lettering. I oh, we got we got. I'm gonna get Troy Puteri who does uh, okay. all the top cow books um, to do that stuff um, because bad lettering will destroy a, a beautifully drawn comic. <laughs> Maybe it was Rob was joking and saying you did the the every, this and this and this and this. Maybe yeah. he was just running through everything, and that's what he, I was thinking of. He, yeah, uh, hopefully I didn't. Uh, steer them incorrectly because i definitely will not be doing the okay. for this book um but yeah it's the first time i've written anything anything of any length that's for sure okay um, and so uh was was there something in the idea that kind of just like you know what i gotta write this on my own well I, i've always had in the back of my brain that i would f- do my own book so um it was never one where I thought, oh, maybe I could try to find a writer that I could work with. It was just more like, no, I'm going to do this. I need to do this on my own. So, okay, um, yeah, yeah, it was my first real stab at it. I was pretty, uh, I would say naive, I guess, to think that uh, that this was going to be even remotely easy, have it being my first time. But, um, uh, hey. but yeah, I decided just to jump right in and do it. No, not that I don't have a lot of faith in you, but did you, but had you built up like relationships with other writers and stuff where you could kind of ping stuff off of them and say, Hey, I'm doing this. What do you think about that? Like, did you kind of seek out help or advice from other people? I did not, (laughs) but, but, you know, I've, I've read quite a number of scripts. Okay. uh, Okay. And I've read lots of books and I read books on writing um, and I've watched tons of movies. So I have a, I think I have a pretty good sense okay. for storytelling and the structure of stories. Um, I never once really thought that I was in over my head. I just felt like I needed to learn how to paddle. That's all. Um, okay. Yeah. Not that again, not that I didn't have faith in you. I was just, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, me talking about it sometimes makes it sound like, like, uh, this book sucks, but, uh, <laughs> I, um, I brought in an editor who is uh, James Powell. He's uh, he's a writer himself, and he's not an easy guy to like. He doesn't give you an easy pass when he's okay. going through your stuff. He he's pretty criti- critical about it. well everything. Um, so uh, once he read it, and he gave me some notes, and and then said, you know, this is actually really good. I was like, okay, then I know, I know that I'm 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 fine. Because if James has given me the, the thumbs up, then this is a pretty solid story. So <laughs> it passed um, the sniff test. <laughs> exactly. I until then, until then, I was shitting my pants because I was like, <laughs> have I just wasted a whole lot of time on something uh, that is not going to be any good? So once J- once James kind of gave me the thumbs up, I was like, okay, phew, <laughs> I can I can breathe again. <laughs> I'm just imagining you putting your hands on your knees, just like. <sighs> oh i was dreading his email after i sent off the script and uh and he said oh, it's gonna take me you know it's gonna take me a few days i'll go through it and give you some suggestions and stuff those are like the longest three days of my life i was like oh my god like he is gonna think that it is the worst and uh and i have just wasted because i i actually didn't do this <laughs> we didn't get into my process i'll briefly state okay that, um I was work. I when I started, I, I was working from a very loose outline, and then being a visual person, I just decided that I would just kind of start drawing this stuff. Okay. And so as I drew stuff, I would come up with new stuff, like new scenes, and then I would draw that. And so I had all these like bits that I thought were really cool, but I'd never sat down and actually like figured out the story. And so after I did that for about a year, no, actually, sorry, it was most close to two years. I had all this stuff. And I started freaking out. That's when I'm like, do these even like connect? Like, do they, does this make any sense? And so I took a year and I wrote the script. I brought everything together and I, and I wrote the script. And then that's when I brought James in after I wrote the script. And I said, I think I feel pretty good about this, but you know, I'm awful close to it. Now I need to get somebody that, that is going to be a little more critical. And so that's when I went to James. And like I said, those, those three days while he was reading, I was like, I was sweating, sweating bullets. Yeah. And then he gave me the thumbs up and then, and then I started drawing again. So, yeah. So it was like two years drawing uh, and, and writing by the seat of my pants. 
then a year of actual writing and no drawing, and then two more years of drawing. And so that's where my five years comes from. <laughs> so in that drawing, were you, was this digital? You were saying loose. So was this digital or were you actually sitting down pen and ink drawing? Oh, yeah. Or... Yeah. This is on boards. Yeah. Yeah. Oh and, a bunch of it, oh and a bunch God. of it didn't make it. You know, like I would write a scene and I would draw it and then I would, you know, do some more stuff. And then I would realize that this scene that I just finished or I finished, you know, a month ago doesn't fit with the scene that I that comes before or the scene that comes after it. So there's stuff that I drew that just it's it got shelved that like no one's going to see it. It's gone. So the amount of anxiety uh, I have right now. I know, right? You? For you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine me? Oh, and my wife was freaking out. She's just like oh my god what are you doing what are you doing i was like i got this i got this uh, but man i was nervous too yeah i got this i got this i hope i got this i hope i got this <laughs> that's that's exactly what i was thinking. oh my god yeah. okay holy shit okay <laughs> <laughs> right yeah Crazy. yeah yeah just, so, just not, not the way to do a book absolutely not the way to do a book so when you get Okay, so you're nervous about hearing back from him. Is there, when you get back like positive or at least constructive criticism back from him, did you do a sigh of relief or were you like, all right, I'm on the right path. Let's move ahead. Was there any kind of release valve like, or was it straight up just like, nope, now it's time to get to work? Oh uh, yeah. Well, a mix. Believe me, okay. I I felt I felt the the weight come off my shoulders. Okay. Uh, when when I got that email, and it wasn't like there was nothing wrong. He had he had points that. Yeah. Uh, and so I had to go back and edit a few things after that, um, to make sure that it ran smoother. Or he suggested you know maybe add something uh, early on to help set up the relationship between the characters or whatever. And I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, you know, the writing wasn't fully done once I got it back from him. I did have to do some, some more writing, but, um, but yeah, the weight came off. I kind of could exhale and kind of like see where I was standing and I could see, I could see where I was going and, uh, with some pretty, with quite, I was quite certain that I would be able to do this and, uh, and yeah. And then, yeah. And then put the head down and finish it off. So, okay. Yeah. And did then did he take more looks at it as you kept going? Uh no. Uh okay. he, he had a he had a final look after I'd done all the art so he could look at the art and look at the story and kind of see it as a whole. Okay. Um and uh and I honestly I don't even remember if I got many notes from that either. There was a couple scenes where he maybe some of the facial expressions he's like I don't know if it's really hitting what you wanted so I would change some faces and stuff. But Okay. Uh, generally everything was pretty much nailed down at that point. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh man. You're, I, I'm just saying it like, uh, here we go. So I, I was interviewed on another podcast head shows. This is my ideas box. Mm -hmm. So it's just full. As you can see, like plan, pre-plan, plan, pre-plan, pre over plan, overwork which is probably not a good thing because there's somewhere on one of these shelves where i have like 24 pages of a comic book written mm -hmm. that i wrote in like 2007 2008 that i was just like man i i, I want to do something what can i do and i wrote an entire and if i told it to you you would probably yell at me for not getting it published or doing something with it because that's what happens anytime i talk about that damn comic book but it's i cannot draw i'm not a good enough illustrator to draw it and i do not have money to pay someone to draw it and i don't feel good not paying somebody to do work so yeah it just sits there and yeah i made the mistake of telling the story to like a friend of mine who's breaking into the film industry and atlanta and she was at the end she was like what the amount of f words that came out of her mouth <laughs> what is wrong with you why are you like I, I don't know man i don't know i don't know i pre-plan so i'm on the other end of the spectrum all the ideas all the pre-planning <laughs> but not the execution so 
Well, you know, I like I said, I'm a visual person. I learn visually and uh, and I get gratification from doing the the visual side of comics. So I just I couldn't wait. I had to start drawing. <laughs> OK, <laughs> um, but now that I've gone through all of that, uh, my next book, I will write before I start drawing. You will, you will outline before you write before you draw. Yeah, 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 definitely a certain outline. Yeah, I just will please, skip, please. I'll just, yeah, I'll just skip the, the going from outline to drawing to going back to writing. I'll skip the drawing part and then do that after I finish writing it. Yeah. So after doing this whole process, do you feel more confident or comfortable in doing something else? Or are you kind of tired after doing it for so long? uh i'm definitely confident that that i can do another one that, okay. that this is the and it was the right decision for me to do this i i, I will say that i am looking forward michael michael may and i are going to do more kill monsters um yes. so i'm kind of kind of spinning off of my my full tilt to go work with michael okay uh we've got he's already written another script that he's he said it was like 127 pages i think he said so um so I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll work through that. We'll, we'll crowdfund that. And then uh, once that's out, uh, hopefully I'll have kind of worked out the ideas for my next, my next book and I can start writing it. And um, yeah, I'm just kind of do that. I kind of see myself going, doing like my own solo book to doing some kill monsters to doing my solo book back and forth, okay. keeping it kind of, kind of fresh and not and giving myself a chance to kind of come up with new stuff. So I don't want to spoil anything, but does, full tilt at the end of full tilt does it end end or is there opportunity for more stories it is it is an open-ended ending but at the same time uh it tells it leaves the story in a spot where i am more than comfortable like that that put it this way i i don't i don't have another i don't have any more to tell okay um but at the same time it's it's left in a way that uh like it's not like uh, yeah it's left open um, okay in terms of being able to continue it if i wanted to but there's this really tells a complete story that i don't and i don't see where it could go after okay. this but it, it's a it, there are, there's a possibility but okay what i've been thinking is that if i was if i decided that i want to do more full tilt ish stuff what i would do is to kind of do like a tales of full tilt where I could um, take characters that were in the story that didn't get a chance to, we didn't really learn too much okay. about them, that sort of stuff, and kind of just do stuff that branches off. Um, the main character, Mosmo Miller, that's sort of him, like his story's done. There's no, you know, it's kind of like Marv in Sin City. Yeah. Uh, not as fun like his story ended, but, uh, but you know how he kind of shows up in other stories yeah. that happened before that event. I could see Mosmo sort of showing up, but his story is, is done for me. So, um, yeah. And, and his last name is Miller. There you and go. Homage. Yeah. That's nice. Uh -huh. And, and, oh my God, do you have an, I, I was going to ask you full tilt is kind of a crime book ish. Do you have an elevator pitch for what full tilt is? I, I should let you, I'm going to let you do that instead well, of me. Yeah. I, I, I'm so bad at selling myself uh i can i'll get i'll give the i'll give the the kind of what I, what i've got here so, okay so full tilt is a gritty and violent tale about a 23rd century crime family conciliary who must face the consequences of a choice he made between love and loyalty the story is uh an action-filled uh future noir epic that touches on many uh many themes such as love and hate family and power nice that's see that pretty much sums it up <laughs> okay <laughs> and then if they're if people are still interested uh they can go to the zoop page and i've got sort of like a i got a bigger description of kind of not a synopsis so much as just giving you more information about uh the world that it that um that it takes place in uh, a little bit about the main character Mosmo miller and um yeah and just some of the a hint okay. at some of the things that he might have to go through um, okay uh how did it feel god i almost don't want to do this 
because I want people to go in there and give you more money. But how <laughs> did it feel hitting your goal in like an hour? Like uh, I got to tell you, it was a little surreal because I honestly, and I'm 100% sincere when I say this, I thought that I would be fighting it out for 30 days. Yeah. I, 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 I saw myself, uh, you know, banging the drums uh, in the <laughs> final four hours trying to push it across. And um, it, yeah, it to happen so fast is like, uh, yeah, I never in my wildest dreams thought anything like that was going to happen. And the platform you're using for that, mm -hmm. I had not heard of before. Is it a newish platform? Yeah, so I was actually talking, I uh, did an interview with Jordan, who is one of the guys at Zoop, and I, I was like, so when did Zoop actually start? And he said that it's coming up on their two-year um, anniversary. Okay. So they've only been around for, well, just less than two years. Um, so yeah, it's a new it's a new platform and, uh, but they're, they're great. And one of the reasons why, um, I went with them is because they essentially deal with everything other than the creating of the book. So they created the website interface. Uh, they set it all up, all the tiers, all the graphics, all that sort of stuff. Um, then they're going to find the printer. Uh, they're going to deal with the printer. They're going to get the books shipped to themselves. Then they fulfill the books. Okay. Uh, the, they fulfill the shipping. So, uh, once I deliver final files, it's sort of done for me. Okay. Um, which is fantastic because uh, I am not the type of person that can uh, <laughs> track down paperweights and talk to printers. Oh and and I being Canadian shipping, I can't ship from Canada because it would cost a fortune. So I'd have to get a I'd have to get a fulfillment service anyways uh, down in the states, and so it just made sense. Like, and they're great guys. I really enjoy. Um, okay. Yeah. They're, they're, they're solid guys. So, so um, the majority of the backers you are, um, you are from here, from the States. I would say the majority will be, okay. uh, yeah. U S based. Okay. That's uh, definitely have a bunch of Canadian people, uh, getting it, but, yeah. um, a lot of them are local here and I've got a local pickup option on the page. So I saw, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. So people here in Vancouver or Vancouver adjacent that don't mind driving into the city, uh, they can back the book and grab that add on. So it, it saves them uh, pretty much all of the shipping costs. So they just have to come to my house. That's all. <laughs> okay. I was, I was about to say, I was like, let me see if I can remember Canada correctly. You you're going to have some fool driving from BC all the way over to you. Is that right? Is I'm BC in BC. But uh, okay, what I'm trying to remember, my buddy. So another Niles guy, yeah, Jason Hanley. Jason Hanley. Yeah, yeah. he's I, way I, on the. He's on the, the east coast. East coast, yeah, but I can't. But I thought Nova Nova Scotia. Oh, okay, okay. Damn it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll change that. Some fool driving from Nova, Nova Scotia. Okay, we're gonna clip that. And we're gonna. <laughs> yeah, he might as well spend the fourteen or eighteen or whatever it is yeah. U.S. dollars to get his ship because gas alone. <laughs> yeah, uh, seriously, uh, he's not even gonna make it to like Montreal before he's uh, <laughs> he's over budget. So he's he's another one. I used to have a radio. I had a radio show during the pandemic, and he came on and was on the radio show. And it was like, holy shit, this is the first time we're seen, like seeing one another. It was yeah. so surreal. Him and our other buddy, Arnie Beck, who's from Iceland, but lives in Denmark. And it was just like, holy shit, we have known one another for like 20 years. And we're finally seeing one another face. It's like, this is all weird. This is weird, but it's awesome. But it's, it's super weird. Uh, yeah, me, me and Jason Hanley go back quite a ways. He did the lettering for... There's a book called, um, oh, what's it called? Western Tales of Terror. Oh. Uh, um, uh, Josh Fialkoff. Yeah I, yeah, I probably have that book. You, you probably do. I did a Stuart, I did a, a story with Stuart Moore. Oh, okay. Uh, in, I think, the first issue. Um, and Jason, I believe, did the lettering for that yeah. stuff. Yeah. He and, and, uh, I... he and he and I uh, play Star Wars Rebellion online together. I'm, see I'm I'll be seeing him to uh not tomorrow I'll see him on Wednesday. <laughs> you whenever you do you need it's like man I had to do this interview with this stupid redneck from East Tennessee <laughs> this big goofy knuckle dragon idiot and it's like 
think his name was Judy or something like that. <laughs> he'll, he'll get kick out. I'm not going to say anything to him. I'll just get the DM <laughs> later. He's awesome. Yeah, he's uh, a great guy. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we're we're uh, we're getting towards the end. So these are more. Here are some more broader, bigger questions for you that I'm curious right. about. Yeah. So, is there what would you like to see more of in like comics or art or anything in that realm is there anything uh, you'd like to see more of yeah i mean uh i what i'd like to see is more artists writing for themselves um okay i think that uh and i mean i i'm, I'm coming from a pretty privileged position and my wife you know uh supports me and, and really allows me to to kind of take the time to to do that and you know um i understand that a lot of artists are living paycheck to paycheck or gig to gig yeah. and they don't have the time to just stop and, and write but uh you know in a in a you know fantasy world I, i'd love to see uh, a lot of my art, artist friends uh i know they have stories in them i know they've got a story to tell and i would love to see that singular vision um and just see them really express themselves uh, as fully as they can um that would be that's what i'd love to see is just that sort of uh having artists just kind of decide you know i'm gonna write this thing i'm gonna i'm gonna write okay. my story and i'm gonna draw it and i'm gonna get it out there i think that would be fantastic okay is there do you have i hope this is not the obvious thing but is there someone you would like to work with like would uh, you want to work with frank miller or do you want to separate oh, the yeah the, no okay I, i've 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 learned you never, never meet your heroes. Yeah. <laughs> so it was funny when Greg and I went and met James Obar in Wizard World in Chicago, he, Greg's favorite book was The Crow. Yeah. And we were both shit scared he was going to be not nice to us. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sitting there, I'm just some big idiot guy that I'm like, I don't give a shit. If he's not nice to us, I'll tell him to go screw himself, man. <laughs> I don't care. And yeah. But Greg was like, man, and he was actually very... Like he was exactly what you expected. He was very quiet. He was very polite. He wasn't like overly friendly or anything, but he was sitting there drawing and he was like, yeah, I'll sign that. Thank you all. Like yeah. personable, but not, but not like over the moon. But I was like, no, that's fine. No, that's a win in my book. That's yeah, a win well, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if not Frank Miller, no, is it anybody. Well, um, yeah other than michael may over and over and over well again. that's the thing um because i don't even know if i would have time to do more okay. stuff um i know that uh there's a local writer here uh um i'm trying to think if yeah, he's got a he's got a he's he's busy he was doing stuff with marvel um this is lonnie uh lonnie nadler um he was doing some stuff at Marvel, but I think he's now focusing on doing kind of his own thing. He's got a book called the sickness coming out, um, with his, uh, with his wife, uh, Jenna, which is going to be really cool. Um, I think Lonnie would be, I actually have a, so I've got a body horror premise, but I don't have a story. So I was actually, we we're going to chat over the summer and see if we okay. can work something out. Um, so Lonnie is the guy that has been on my, on my list and um actually tim daniel who does the cover who did the cover and the logo for full tilt um tim is tim's a great guy and he's right he's a writer as well and um and i think that we probably have something in us uh, okay a collaboration in there somewhere um but beyond that there's not a lot of people that i'm like you know uh yeah no okay okay <laughs> maybe because i just i feel like now i can write for myself yeah uh, that that kind of need to define external uh stimuli is sort of gone I don't, it's okay. all kind of coming from within now so it's it's open to tap within yeah you. yeah okay. i think that there's i think there's enough in me that i don't really need to go looking around so i don't know <laughs> okay sorry uh, do you no 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 do you set any goals or have like a checklist it kind of sounds like you have a loose version of one uh at this point no uh okay. i think that working at marvel was like it 
Okay. And uh, I managed to get two issues of things there. And uh, both times my editors left, like the moment the book was published. Uh, so nothing like getting your foot in and then losing your editor and then getting your foot in and then losing your editor. Oh I felt like I'm the, the death kneel to Marvel editors. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but having, having obtained that certain level, whatever, however you want to look at it, um, was cool, but that's, that's not, it wasn't fulfilling. So I think that I kind of have to just look within and tell the stories that I, that are in me. I'm at, okay. I'm kind of, that's where I'm at now. So as for a checklist, just to keep doing what I'm doing, Okay. Uh, I don't really have any, uh, yeah, I don't have any like greater goals, which sounds pretty oh. bad. My goal is just to keep doing my thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, that may answer the next question is, do you know what you'd like to do in the next 10 years? But yeah, I've already kind of got a bit of a story idea for my next book. I've got, uh, okay. I have, again, I've got a premise. I'm now just looking for a story, but uh, this one will be a, a little easier for me than the body horror because body horror is not really generally my thing. Um, this is again will be set in the future. It'll have uh, uh, it'll kind of talk to some of my interest in like um, Egyptian, uh, like the the idea of the pharaohs and and uh, and that sort of thing. Um, okay, I have to be really careful that uh, you know cultural cultural appropriation. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, and that sort of thing. I, I have to, I'll have to think of that um and try to work within a certain like have a sensitivity reader or or somebody that that i can talk to about it okay Uh, but uh i definitely have like this thing kind of growing in my brain that i think is uh, my next book so well uh, on the art side are there different styles you want do you want to try doing different things like maybe do like a short story that's all just digital or do you think or you know different color or is that something you're also thinking about too um yeah yeah uh, so i i'm also a big fan of ashley wood um oh, yeah. i've got a lot of ashley wood's books and uh he'll do this sort of like spot color like a singular yeah color um and kind of like off register and um and i really like that aesthetic I, that that's something i dig my color sense is not good though oh, okay um, so so it so his sort of style in terms of what how he uses color fits with something that i could probably pull off okay so that's i think that's one thing that i'm thinking about for the next book is to have that sort of singular color every once in a while um you know just to create some sort of depth or whatever but have you um, read the darwin cook parker books yeah yeah those those are some because it's i'm an old school printer so they're all like two color yeah and that just oh my god like it just and even they're if i remember correctly they're on like a cream stock yeah as opposed to a plain white st- I, those two those books he did blow my mind yeah like, yeah i know they're they're fantastic yeah, yeah for sure okay uh if there was any book other than full tilt oh no you can't recommend full tilt for this that you would could tell a parent to give to a kid to get them into comic books oh my could be your own could be somebody else although it wouldn't be mine i was gonna say it could be i was trying to think of a polite way to say that like, yeah no it wouldn't be mine i don't think i've done anything that well i mean kill all monsters yeah there are kids ki- there are kids that really enjoy kill all monsters okay okay um and that's filter through through the parents though uh you know i think they see it first before they just hand it to the kids but <laughs> um because there is violence in it it a lot of it well some of it happens off off page so you know yeah. you don't you, it's not super graphic but um it is it is not like you know captain underpants <laughs> yeah. um, uh man i'm trying to think i i've never really read books that would fall into a more of a kid friendly okay so i'm really really not so i've bought blank. does my favorite comic series of all time was Su- is superman for all seasons because i love the story and i love that with the i, well, I love tim sales art but i love that they did the watercolor coloring in that mm-hmm. 
And so I've bought anytime a friend of mine has a kid, I buy a copy of that book. I was like, they're going to enjoy it as a kid because of the art and it's colorful and all that. But when they get older, they'll understand the themes and everything. And it's just a good book for kids that is still grown up. Yeah. In my, I just my actually, mind. I just looked over at my, I've got books like all, all just everywhere. And I see Mouse Guard. Mouse Guard's a, oh, yeah. a book that I think kids would really dig. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh final question is if you could talk to the 14 year old version of yourself what would you tell them fourteen year old I would say uh, <laughs> buy apple stock <laughs> <laughs> that's the um, first honest one no I'm just kidding <laughs> yeah, everybody else I'm is sure like, everyone keep going keep I'm it sure up. everyone says buy apple stock no um, i literally oh, really? think you're the first oh. <laughs> that's why i said you're the first honest one everybody else is like well i would t- tell them to keep their head up and draw them i'm just kidding to any of my former guests but <laughs> you're the first one to be like shit no buy real estate yeah <laughs> i i would say i would say as a well actually i think i was done by then but i'd say uh at uh at an early age i would tell myself not to be a vancouver canucks fan <laughs> Oh geez, there you go. Oh my god, we got to bring the hockey in here somehow, you know. Yeah, I'm Canadian, eh? So, eh. <laughs> game on, game on. <laughs> oh my god, don't don't get me started. I'll start quoting Strange Brew, man. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> that my dad and movies. I could give you a list of like a dozen movies he made me watch, and Strange Brew was one of those. Yeah, that's and unfortunate. It, <laughs> well no no here's the unfortunate one i love telling people this to see the expression on their face i think i was 10 or 11 he's flipping around and he's like oh hell here you go you need to watch this movie it was like a 11 o'clock or midnight on a friday or saturday night it was deliverance oh, he made geez. me watch deliverance when i yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's i don't I, I don't know if that's good parenting. <laughs> oh, the stuff they let me watch when I was a kid. Oh yeah. my God. But yeah, deliverance. He's like, oh hell, this is good. You need to watch this one. Here you go. I'm going to bed. So I'm just sitting there watching <laughs> it, looking out the window, going, oh shit. I thought you I, I thought you were gonna say a clockwork orange. <laughs> <laughs> no, because that had nudity. I could see all the uh, violence here, all the cursing, but yeah. any boobs, it was yeah, turn your head, uh, turn your head. Yeah. Yeah. so 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 weird in the priorities <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> here here watch taxi driver but, but you, <laughs> oh, that's weird your... that you would say no. that's weird that you would say that i actually just watched rewatched taxi driver like three nights ago yeah i hadn't watched it in like oh 20 years uh, i think the last time i watched it it was one of those i was like i think i'm gonna not watch this again <laughs> yeah I, it, I didn't really enjoy it no. I got about halfway through and I'm like, uh, I don't know if I want to watch it. And I finished it. But um, yeah, there was some stuff in it that was just like, well, oh, that didn't age well. <laughs> no. Oh, there's a lot that didn't age yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was just kind of like, yeah, no one needs to, no one in my family needs me to recommend this. They can okay. discover it on their own if they, <laughs> but yeah. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll actually end on a funnier question. Do you know the movie you watched the most as a kid? As that a you, kid, like that you may have rented from the video store, right? Yeah. Uh well, I would say it was pre, probably Tron. There you go. Yeah, it was probably Tron, um, or or the Warriors. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I did a- not. I had never seen the Warriors until like a year or two ago. Yeah. Somehow it just was one. And I say this in the most positive and in the most ally driven way. I was like, this movie is very gay. <laughs> and it, it just, everybody, I was like, this seems like a musical. This doesn't, I say that in a positive, I am all in support, but I was like, all these guys are supposed to be tough. It, they're like three steps away from doing the snaps from the sharks yeah. and the jets. Like, yeah, it, uh, it is a little odd it struck me as odd um even as a young kid but something that i think was pretty cool was that um was that it wasn't just like black gangs and white gangs and, yeah and, 
yeah like there, yeah. like the the races were all mixed and yeah. and no one and it never came up it was never a yeah. discussion it was never a, um and i was i thought that was pretty cool um but, but, but uh, i, but I yeah. think look looking at it as like a 42 year old i was like man this is like a musical this is yeah. <laughs> this is very much like if you tried to tell kids today that these all guys were tough yeah they well, might you know like the, you. <laughs> you know the guys with the fedoras and the the pink yeah. shiny vests as they're like We're, yeah in the baseball uniforms it was just oh, like hey don't don't go crapping on the baseball field no i'm not i'm just saying <laughs> this is a music like this is not i don't know i don't know yeah it reminds me of kiss the band kiss yeah oh god yeah you know with that with the makeup and uh and that sort of thing because uh, so, that kiss would have been big right around that time too i think so uh so I am uh, very, I am very hesitant to ask this because yeah. it's one of my favorite films. But what did you uh -oh. think of the Tron Legacy? Uh, I enjoyed it for the most part. Okay. Um. Yeah i I enjoyed it for the most part. The soundtrack is fantastic. Oh yeah, um, it's it, it's it's. I think maybe the soundtrack I've listened to the most. I think it may be the album because it's a great work album. To just yeah. sit there and work but yeah. that i don't know that movie is just like a comfort movie to me what for whatever i think it's just visually stunning yeah and it's sure. and everybody i started reading like negative reviews and they're like it's too complicated i was like i don't <laughs> it's all there like yeah. what are you talking about complicated like yeah. it's it's I, I that that part was just like did you all fall asleep or something? Like what is happening? Like what is, how do you, how did you not follow what was happening? But yeah, that's, that's, that's a stretch. I would say. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> no, I enjoyed okay. that movie. I enjoyed yeah. that movie. And apparently they're making another one. Um, yeah, but it's not by the same guy and it's yeah. not that kind of, and I think Jared Leto is kind of taking the reins on it. And I'm like, I may have yeah. to pass on this one. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's weird. It's like, I don't really have, I'm not like super down on him, but, um, but having, have you ever watched a Requiem for a dream? Yes. A Requ Requiem of a dream. I can't. Requiem for a dream. I saw that dream. in the theater and like, about puke my guts out. And that the, when it showed all the four quick, I was in the back, just like, yeah, mm, like, like that, is. like that movie. So there's people will say like, what sometimes I ask, like what movie, um, do you absolutely think is fantastic but would never watch again yep. and that is the first film that comes to mind is that by the time that movie is over i'm gutted and it's and it's phenomenal but i never yeah. want to put myself through that again um and so when i see jared leto's face i am in that movie and i have okay. a real tough time uh not seeing like all that crazy ugly horrible stuff that was in that film when i see him like it almost it uh, it almost ruined the newer uh blade runner because you know he shows oh, yeah. up that too right and it's like um <laughs> luckily his his he's not in it a lot so he uh i remember when that movie came out i saw it in the theater and immediately walked out and i was like they should show this in every high school if mm -hmm. they want to do any anti-drug stuff mm -hmm. here's what you need to do <laughs> you need to show this because yeah the yeah. scene of the R, oh, oh yeah, God. Oh. Oh. and just them, you know, right at the end, just the curling up and yeah, just like oh, I like, oh no, <laughs> yeah, never, uh, yeah. Just, who wants so, to? Yeah. A, a funny thing on the the uh, of the old Niles boards is they would every Tuesday they would post like here's all the albums that are coming out, here's all the movies that are coming out, and I was living with my parents making decent money at the print shop. So I would just buy it as, as you can, well, you can't really see cause it's dark all the D CDs, like yeah. 5,000 CDs, probably 3000 DVDs. <laughs> I would just load up and there were, I would always list out, you know, I'd look through and list out. I was like, here's all the ones I think I might get. And one of the guys, Ben Wheeler, he gave me so much shit. Cause I put uh, what was it mystic river. And he was like, who the hell wants to see that movie? <laughs> he was like, it's great. But why the hell would you want to buy that on DVD to rewatch again and again? I was like, <laughs> and I got it and watched it. And I was like, why the hell did I buy this movie? <laughs> like, what is happening? 
this movie is depressing as shit. I was like, yeah. oh god, it's like yeah, bridge, on, be- bridge on the River Kwai, something like that. That's good. Yeah, Mystic yeah. River, no. Mystic Pizza, yes. Uh, Mystic River, <laughs> no. Okay. No. What the hell? <laughs> the other, the other film on my list of watched it once and can't watch it again is Into the Wild. So I never watched that because I read the book and I yeah. read the book thinking the kid came off like an asshole and everybody just praised him. I was like, no, he's just a little, yeah, preppy douche like yeah we should not be admiring this kid like he had plenty of opportunities to do good in this world yeah and and but it, yeah it's still the ending was like one that was just like well <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah taxi driver is definitely up there clockwork orange is one yeah i have a ton that it's like i have to be in the right mood to rewatch it like 2001 yeah. i have to be in the right headspace to rewatch that film yeah. But I like rewatching it because it's unbelievable. What right. do you think of 2010? I have never seen 2010. Oh, really? So I've actually got loaded up in my Plex is all these sci-fi movies from the 70s and 80s that I've never seen, like Silent Running, Capricorn One, Black. I think I saw the Black Hole when I was a kid. I just watched that like six months ago. Uh, 2010? 2010? oh uh, black hole does not hold up no no okay <laughs> and one called somebody recommended called miracle mile i think is a like oh. a, a nuclear bomb movie but oh. i've got all those low downs like eventually i need to watch these yeah but and yeah, the, the ones... what, what, what's the other one where they you get to a certain age and then they kill you oh logan's run Logan's Run. I've got that. I don't know why I don't have it pulled over. I've got these on my desktop so I can remember to watch them. Logan's Run's the other one I've never seen. Yeah, the the premise is is pretty good. the 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 follow through I is not okay. Yeah, it's it's some of these some of these seventies uh, films need to be taken with a little bit of <laughs> grain of salt. You know, they're classics, uh, but at the same time, kind of like. Yeah. So, so I'll give you another dad's dad film. Oh God, see now. So I have a movie <laughs> podcast that I'm eventually going to do. Yeah. If you were willing, I'll have you back on that to oh, talk yeah, about. Sure. Yeah. But while I still have, I will. I swear to God, we'll end on this. But. Uh, one of my dad's favorite films was the taking of Pelham one, two, three with Walter Matthau. Yeah. I've never seen it. I came really oh. close to renting it. Um, you, get, like you really gotta close. see, cause you talk about like the melting pot aspect of, uh, uh, the warriors. Yeah. Pelham one, two, three. Cause it's, right. it's seventies, New York. So yeah. it's poor people, old people, rich people, like it's everybody and walter mathau walter mathau uh robert shaw Mm -hmm. um jerry stiller i'm trying (laughs) to think of who the four the four bad guys it's robert shaw hector elizondo was young martin balsam and the guy who played wilson on uh tim taylor on tool time oh (laughs) uh, whatever that show was yeah yeah it's but that's the four bad guys in that film i was like is that Wilson? Hold on. And I did that. I was like, that's Wilson. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh shit. But that movie, like, there was a buddy of mine that was like, all right, man. I, I was screening films at at uh his space called the Central Collective. And I told him, I was like, man, I really want to show the show the taking of Palom one, two, three. And uh he was like, Man, I, I don't I don't think I know that one. I was like, hold on, let me let me play this for you. God, this is not gonna work. It's not, I can't believe it's not on. Oh God, this is where editing will come into play. <laughs> I just want to play a little bit of the intro. Just to show you. I was like, this is all I did for my buddy. I was like, here you go. Oh, you're drinking. Son of a bitch. Of course, the ads on YouTube. Yeah. Killing me. This is killing the... Here you go. I got to wait till the horns come in. 
so sick. I can't hear anything. So. Did you hear that? I didn't hear anything. No. Oh man. I wonder if it cut it out. Oh, well, I'll, uh, yeah, look it up. It's, I, I got like five seconds into the theme for yeah. my buddy and he's like, I'm in, I'm going to watch this movie. <laughs> it's so good. It's so seventies. That's weird uh, that it cut out. Yeah. I guess, I guess, uh, my microphone was like, you're going to get flagged if you play copyright <laughs> mi music on your podcast. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> anyway. All right. That's enough. I'll let you go. Thank you so much for being on. Oh, my pleasure.